The funeral of John and Alice Reevely was held on the morning of July 2nd in the village church at Selborne St. Giles. It was another hot, still day, and the perfume of the honeysuckle over the lich gate hung heavy in the air, making one drowsy even before noon. The yew trees in the graveyard looked dusty in the heat. The cortege came in slowly, two coffins borne by young men from the village. Most of them had been to school with either Joseph or Matthew, at least for the first few years of their lives, played football with them, or spent hours on the edge of the river fishing, or generally dreaming away the summers. Now they shuffled one foot in front of the other, careful to look straight ahead and balance the weight without stumbling. The tilted stones of the path had been worn uneven by a thousand years of worshippers, mourners, and celebrants from Saxon times to the present day, and the modern world of Victoria's grandson, George V. Joseph walked behind them, Hannah on his arm, barely keeping her composure. She had purchased a new black dress in Cambridge and a black straw hat with a veil. She kept her chin high, but Joseph had a strong feeling that her eyes were almost closed, and she was clinging to him to guide her. She had hated the days of waiting. Every room she went into reminded her of her loss. The kitchen was worst. It was full of memories. Cloths Alice had stitched, plates with the wildflowers painted on them that she had loved, the flat basket she used to collect the dried heads from the roses, the corn dolly she had bought at the Maddingley Fair. The smell of food brought back memories of crumpets and lardy cakes and hot savoury onion clangers with suet crust. Alice had liked to buy the blue-veined double cottonum cheese and butter by the yard, instead of the modern weights. It was the smallest things that hurt Hannah the most, perhaps because they caught her unaware. Letty arranging flowers in the wrong jug, one Alice would never have chosen. Horatio the cat sitting in the scullery, where Alice would not have permitted him. The fish delivery boy being cheeky and answering back where he would not have dared to before. All of these were the first marks of irrevocable change. Matthew walked with Judith a few steps behind, both of them stiff and staring straight ahead. Judith, too, had a veiled hat and a new black dress with sleeves right down to the backs of her hands, and a skirt so slender it obliged her to walk daintily. She did not like it, but it was actually dramatically becoming to her. 